So Ed Sheeran's being sued for the similarities between his song Thinking Out Loud and Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On. They do sound similar for one specific reason, as the lawsuit explains. The prominence of the bass line and the drum composition throughout Let's Get It On make the compositional elements qualitatively unique, copyrightable, and important to the musical work as a whole. This really can't be denied. The two songs have the same bass line, the same drum groove, the same tempo. They sound similar. You can go check out Rick Beato's video on the subject where he plays the two of them side by side so you can hear for yourself. Now, the lawsuit goes on to claim that no other identified song in history prior to Let's Get It On includes a 1-3-4-5 or a 1-1-6-4-5 progression at the same tempo of 80 beats per minute. And yea, for it was written down upon high, no other song in history has ever used these chords in this order at this tempo. Except, you know, Bach. <laughs> That's like ancient history, though. That doesn't fall under copyright protection. Is there anything in the modern era? Well, the $100 million lawsuit has been filed on behalf of Ed Townsend, the co-songwriter of Let's Get It On. Ed Townsend is most famous as a performing artist for his minor 1958 hit, For Your Love. If you listen to For Your Love's chord progression, its triplet piano riff, its drum groove, its tempo, Ed Townsend clearly stole all of those elements from 1954's doo-wop hit, Earth Angel by the Penguins, which has all of the same elements. For your love. A reasonable person would just chalk it up to stylistic similarity. For Your Love is a derivative work, but it's a different song. It has a different melody. I'm not a legal expert, so I can't comment on how any of this relates to the law, but uh, from a musical and historical perspective, the practice of copying bass lines from earlier work to create new compositions is the very foundation of how Western music was written, how it was taught, and how it was developed for the past several hundred years. In fact, the practice of cantus firmus, using a pre-existing melody as a baseline for a new work, has existed for at least a thousand years. In the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, it became common for composers to write paraphrase masses for the church, using popular secular tunes as baselines or inner voices when writing different music around it. All of the masters from this era, from Guillaume Dufay to Josquin des Prés to Palestrina wrote many of these paraphrase masses to reach great musical and aesthetic heights. Now eventually this practice became so codified as a foundational element in composition that borrowing other melodies through Contus Firmus became a default pedagogical tool, culminating in Johann Fuchs's treatise Gratus ad Parnassum, a textbook we still use today. Now, jumping forward to the 20th century, jazz musicians have frequently relied upon the practice of contrafact, or using one song's chord progression to write another melody. The chords to George Gershwin's I've Got Rhythm have been duplicated many times with many different melodies, but the same basic 32-bar structure known as rhythm changes. Using this lawsuit's logic, George Gershwin's estate should get all of the royalties from the Flintstones theme. <laughs> If we take a historical view, the baseline of Let's Get It On is the contus firmus of Thinking Out Loud. Thinking Out Loud is a contrafact of Let's Get It On. Same progression, but different melody. Isn't that a bit of a stretch? We're not talking about masses here, we're talking about pop songs. Can you even make the comparison? Well, that's true, but music is music. And there's actually a little bit more difference between the two songs than what I initially implied. Ed Sheeran's song has a slightly different structure with a different pre-chorus and a different post-chorus. And it's also important to mention that although the bass lines are the same, the chords are actually slightly different between the two songs. Thinking Out Loud's second chord is a D over F sharp, a one chord with a third in its bass, rendered in classical notation as one six. But this chord in the sequence of Let's Get It On 
on is F sharp minor, the triad built on the third degree of the scale, or the three minor chord. This is no matter, the lawsuit claims. As any freshman harmony textbook will attest, the one chord with the third scale degree in the bass may stand in or substitute for the three chord without affecting the function of the progression. That's a fairly bold statement. The most popular freshman harmony textbook right now in America is Tonal Harmony by Costca Payne, and there's no discussion of functional harmony whatsoever in that book. Okay, so I've heard you use that term functional harmony before. What exactly is that, and why is it relevant here? Function refers to how a chord behaves in a sequence. You can loosely think of it like grammatical structures, like nouns and adjectives. The one chord has tonic function. It feels like home. It's at rest. The four chord has subdominant or predominant function. It feels like there's some motion away from home. The five chord has dominant function. It asks to be resolved back home to the tonic. What about the 1, 6, and the 3 minor chords? What are their functions? Well, let's ask a dead German. Arnold Schoenberg, writing in his 1911 treatise Theory of Harmony, says that, For if the bass tone is E, for example, but E is the lowest tone of the 6th chord, then this E of the bass is completely irrelevant to the character of the connection this chord will make with the next. It is rather the C, the root, by which the force and the significance of the harmonic progression is measured. So 1, 6 has the same tonic function as 1. D over F sharp is a synonym of D. But what function does 3 minor have? Let's ask another dead German. Hugo Riemann, in his influential text Harmony Simplified, which as a title is a bit of a misnomer, talks about parallel clong, which is a concept in functional harmony wherein the substitution of the major sixth for the perfect fifth above in the major triad results in the relative of a given triad. If we do this with a D tonic one chord, we substitute the fifth with a sixth and get a B minor, the six minor, or the relative tonic, also known as the relative minor, incidentally. If we do the same with A, the five chord in the key of D, we get an F sharp minor, the three minor chord, or what Riemann would call the relative dominant. So we have here two different functions. One six is a tonic, and three minor is a relative dominant. You can think of it this way. The words read, 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 and read all sound fairly similar, but mean quite different things depending on the context. Okay, I kind of get your point, but that second chord on thinking out loud and let's get it on really does sound exactly the same to me. Why might that be? Now, F sharp minor does share two common tones with D, the tonic, but it also shares two common tones with A, the dominant. A common term for the three minor chord is the mediant, because it's halfway in between the dominant and the tonic. Now, there are other interpretations of this chord and its function. Stephen Lyatt's writing in The Complete Musician says that three minor may substitute for one six to create a tonic extension, just as six minor may substitute for tonic. This interpretation might seem to vindicate indicate the lawsuit. Three minor and one six have the same function, therefore the chord progressions are the same, therefore Ed Sheeran owes a hundred million dollars. And I don't know, maybe that passes as a legal analysis, but as a musical analysis, that is casting a shockingly wide net. It's like the plaintiffs aren't just claiming a chord progression as their own, they're claiming the pattern behind it. They're claiming the very idea of a tonic chord followed by a substitute tonic chord followed by a predominant and then a dominant. That's like laying claim to an adjective followed by a noun followed by a verb. Is the functional pattern, the composition itself, can you own that? I own all of this. This is mine. I own the language. It's mine. If that's the case, then the chords to thinking out loud and let's get it on have the same functional analysis as Earth Angel. The same song that Ed Townsend ripped off before he co-wrote Let's Get It On. Earth Angel's second chord is six minor, and both Hugo Ryman and Stephen Lyatz agree that it has a substitute tonic function. Using the lawsuit's own logic, it's not Ed Sheeran that's guilty of copyright infringement. It's Ed Townsend. You have the wrong Ed! You have the wrong Ed! We've been talking about the thread that's similar between these two songs, the bass line and its harmonization, but historically speaking, songs have been cited for copyright infringement not because of that, but because of melodic connections. But Thinking Out Loud and Let's Get It On don't have any. They have very different melodies. Despite this, the lawsuit spends several pages throwing as much jargon at you to try and convince you that they are, in fact, the same melody when you can clearly hear that they aren't. And uh, honestly, it's kind of sad. I don't even want to bother trying to debunk it, but you can read it 
the lawsuit is public record, it is in the description. I encourage you guys to read the lawsuit yourselves so that you can imagine that you're a juror sitting in a courtroom listening to the similarities between the two songs with this corpus of impressive sounding music theory to confirm your suspicions. What will you think? What's dangerous here is that the jury that will be deciding this $100 million case likely won't have much music theory education to speak of, and so whichever side throws the most jargon might be likely to win. All of music, to some degree or another, is iterative. And if a jury can be convinced that in this case, it's a bad thing, that a law was broken, then certain actors will have used the legal system to enrich themselves, and not the musical tradition.